Um, I'm delighted to come here tonight and to talk to you about this topic. It's um, been a long-going, um, uh, long-standing interest of mine to look at the eugenics movement, and I've had the privilege of working with one of the world's most eminent historians of eugenics, Professor Diane Paul, whom a number of you will have met as she's visited here uh, in Dunedin, visited me here in Dunedin a number of times, and we've uh, done a, a uh, series of papers together on a variety of topics and I'll come right back to that at the very end. So what I want to do today is to talk to you about the eugenics movement in New Zealand and tell you a little bit about um, its surprising history. It certainly was surprising to me and I suspect it might be su surprising to you as well. So I want to start off by making sure that everybody knows what I'm talking about, uh, what I mean by the eugenics movement. So the eugenics movement was a social and political movement that reached its peak in about the second and, well, sorry, the third and fourth decades of the 20th century. It had the most laudable goals. It wanted to improve the human condition. And it's critical when we think about the history of the eugenics movement to remember that. People had laudable goals and they had the best intentions. The word eugenics today uh, is no longer a positive word and to be labeled as a eugenist or a eugenicist is not a compliment, right? But it's important to realize that people um, from whom we are intellectually descendant, particularly me as a geneticist, people at the time were nearly all, who were geneticists and scientists in general, were nearly all pro-eugenic. They wanted to improve the human species and the bit where it gets dicey in our modern view is by controlling breeding. They wanted, uh, Essentially, they had two approaches. One was to encourage the, the right sort of people, those who had uh, characters that were considered good and desirable in society. They wanted to encourage those people to have more children. So, of course, those are people like doctors, lawyers, and, of course, university professors. Right? <laughs> they also wanted to discourage breeding by those with what were considered undesirable traits. And that is what came to be associated with eugenics. It's all very well to encourage people to have more children. It's actually, as a policy, rather difficult to, um, to get to work, right? So people have tried to, and various governments have tried to encourage people to have more children, and it's not something that works very easily. Uh, but you can certainly discourage people, and discourage covered a whole spectrum, right? So discourage might have just been a little bit of propaganda. Discourage might have been uh, involuntary segregation. It might have been sterilisation, or in some extreme cases, it simply meant execution. So negative eugenics is what uh, is a sort of longer title for what was standardly called um, eugenics. So the, the term was invented by Francis Galton, who was um, one of Darwin's cousins, one of the, the Darwin Wedgwood Galton um, uh, family. And like all good Victorian gentlemen, he had a training in ancient Greek. And so when he was looking for a term for the movement that he was, he's given the credit of founding, he went back to ancient Greek, and eugenase is good in birth for Greek, uh, but the idea is much older than, than Galton. And in fact, if you look back in almost any society, certainly any part of Western society, you can find eugenic ideas. The idea that people should be careful about who reproduces, you can find in all sorts of writing, uh, and you can certainly easily find it, um, for example, in Plato. So, um, what was Galton's rationale? Why did he bother to invent a term, and why did he why was he so concerned about it, and why is he credited with being the founder of the modern eugenics movement? Well, the reason is he wrote about it quite a lot, but he had some reasonable kind of rationale. So, uh, Gelton's rationale started off with the assumption that character was inherited. Blood will tell. And if, you know, he was simply reflecting what was a widespread societal view at the time. So, how many people here have read some Dickens? Put your hand up if you read some Dickens. You know, that's a great result, because I ask that of my first year class, you know, and... <laughs> And I get like two or three hands, and then I say, how many have seen a video or a film that's... And of course, they don't know that Dickens wrote the thing. So you, you people are really, you know, really well-educated. What's one of the recurring themes in Dickens? It's blood will tell, right? David Copperfield's a great example of it, right? David Copperfield, David Copperfield wins out in the end because he had the right kind of breeding, right? His parental um, stock really mattered, and that's why... It's not why, but that's, that's the underlying sort of moral of why it worked out in the end. He was the right kind of person. So 
Uh, Galton was also one of the early statisticians. He collected lots of statistics around the place, and one of the things he collected were the number of children that different families had. And he noticed, Galton himself didn't have any children, that eminent Victorian families had fewer children. So his data, which was some of the first that was collected, um, simply was reinforced later on. There was this wonderful uh, British Royal Commission for the Care and Control of the Feeble-Minded, and they collected some data that suggested feeble-minded had seven child couples, had seven children on average, whereas normal-minded individuals had just four children on average. So this kind of data was easy to gather. He noticed that Victorian families had fewest children, right? So he now knows all about evolutionary theory from his cousin Charles, and the, the, the conclusion is obvious, right? If character's inherited and those with good character have fewer children, then the frequency of good character and genius and all these other desirable things would decline, right? It's, the logic is quite clear. And civilization, not the least of which the British Empire, was at risk. So his, his argument was, was perfectly plausible and... Um, and was in fact based on some actual data. Some of the data that came subsequently um, perhaps was not quite so um, uh, robust. So how many people here have heard of the Kelly Cat family? I'm going to ask a slightly harder question. Well, not quite so many. Either. If you've done some psychology, you might have come across the Kelly Cat family. So the Kelly Cat family were a rural New Jersey clan in which feeble-mindedness was, was apparently rampant. Now, you've heard me talk about feeble-mindedness. So feeble-mindedness was, was the term that was used for mental defect, and it had a technical definition. But the reason the eugenicists or eugenists were so concerned about feeble-mindedness is that so many of society's ills apparently were rooted in feeble-mindedness. So those who were the criminalistic, those who were the alcoholics, those who were adulterers, those who were, in, you know, who were paupers, a lot of that stemmed, if not all of that, stemmed from being feeble-minded. So if you could deal with the underlying cause, feeble-mindedness, then you could do something about it. So the Kalikak family, again, good Greek origins. Kalikak comes from the good and the bad words for Greek, and I'm just looking for a pointer. Am I going to find, or maybe, does this work? Yes, right. Okay, so um, in the middle here we see Martin Kalikak who founded the Kalikak dynasty. And you can't read the small print, but I'm going to read it out to you anyway. But, um, so Martin Kalikak in the middle here, um, here he has, and it says that um, he married a worthy Quakeress. And here she is looking like a pilgrim from Plymouth Plantation just south of Boston. And she bore seven upright worthy children. And here they are looking like little pilgrims, complete with hats and all. And from these seven worthy children came hundreds of the highest types of human beings. So they were the doctors, the lawyers, and the university professors. If you look on the other side of the diagram, however, it says he dallied with a feeble-minded tavern girl. Well, he did rather more than dally, because, <laughs> because she, as it says here, bore a son known as Old Horror. And here's Old Horror here, and you've got to love this. Here are the little horns on his forehead there, right? Looking just like a little devil. And um, Old Horror, who had ten children. So there's the fecundity you can see just there. And from Old Horror's ten children came hundreds of the lowest types of human beings. So they were the feeble-minded, but also and this is the reason it mattered so much to society, they were the criminalistic, the licentious, the alcoholics, and so on. Right? So they were the ones that were causing all these societal problems. I say this data was widely accepted. And just to show you how widely accepted it is, this data was collected in the very late 1890s into the 1950s decade of the 20th century, and a tiny bit beyond that. And yet this textbook, this comes from a university psychology textbook, and not a psychology textbook from the 1920s or 30s. It comes from a psychology textbook from the 1960s, right? And not just any old psychology textbook, a psychology textbook written by two Ivy League professors from Columbia University in New York, right? So when I say the data was widely accepted, it was widely accepted well after many of the problems had been pointed out by critics of this work. So this work was subject to a lot of criticism, and yet that criticism didn't seem to make much difference, and I've written about that as well. So um, that's the Kalikak family. And, and the, 
this, this data had enormous influence. So this and various other bits of data had enormous influence in a number of places that we associate with the word eugenics. So um, eugenics had significant political power in America. Um, for example, it led to the um, Immigration Restriction Act of 1924. So uh, you, you're probably not experts on American history, but this was a blatantly racist act that sought to stem immigration from Southern Europe. Right? So Southern Europe, we're talking about the Italians and the Greeks. And they were, of course, they were particularly feeble-minded because they weren't doing very well on the IQ tests that were being given to them when they landed. Well, that was not perhaps surprising. Their English ability was not that great, and there were all sorts of questions about um, what sort of things you should do in high society uh, around Boston and New York. Well, you know, the questions weren't even in Greek, let alone what the answer should have been. So there were all sorts of problems with the data, but nevertheless that, that Immigration Restriction Act was um, easily passed. And, and part of the reason for that, you can see that in this wonderful headline here from Dearborn as a place nowhere in Michigan, and, but you can see the headline here, melting pot dross takes fifth of tax dollar. So, you know, if you're trying to irritate an American voter, the best way to do it is to talk about what their taxes are being wasted on. Actually, you might have discovered that also works very well here. So, um, melting pot dross, so that was the, that was the, that was the um, immigration from southern Europe, right? And the dross were those from, particularly from Italy and from uh, Greece, who were costing you 20 cents of every dollar you had to pay in tax, and you didn't like paying even that dollar, but to have 20 cents wasted on something that could easily be stopped, while well, you clearly could see what the solution was. Some 30 states passed compulsory sterilization laws. So this, these were laws that uh, allowed for the sterilization of those who were certified as feeble-minded. And there were more than 60,000 people sterilized in America in the 1920s and 30s. Interestingly, and I'm, I put this up there so you can all read it, but I would never have guessed that most of those sterilizations would have occurred in California. So California had by far the most efficient sterilization program of all American states. And not surprisingly, these laws went to, uh, were tested in the American Supreme Court. Right? That's how the American system works. And the Supreme Court upheld many laws. And I just want to read you um, a part of the opinion that upheld the um, the, what was called the Buck versus Bell case, which was um, about the Virginia sterilization law that led, when it was upheld, to the sterilization of Carrie Buck. So um, the, the opinion was written by Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., whom a number of you would have come across. Um, uh, he, he was uh, an American uh, Civil War hero, and he was undoubtedly a very brave man. He's a hero of many uh, progressive politicians because he wrote a number of opinions upholding freedom of speech. He also wrote opinions uh, as a Supreme Court judge um, uh, allowing Labour to organise, so pro-union uh, laws upholding those kinds of laws. Um, but he also wrote this opinion. Uh, Wendell Holmes Jr. was was quite an orator, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to do it justice, but even with my poor rendition, you will see these are powerful words. We have seen more than once that the public welfare may call upon the best citizens for their lives. So that's a reference, of course, to his Civil War service. It would be strange if it could not call upon those who already sapped the strength of the state for these lesser sacrifices in order to prevent our being swamped with incompetence. It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. Those are powerful words, right? And so you can see that right across the American political spectrum, there was support for these laws. So, of course, it wasn't just America. You can... Um, you can uh, associate the word eugenics with Nazi Germany. So if I ask my third year genetics class what they know about eugenics, they usually don't know very much, but they'll tell you that it's associated with the Nazi government of Germany. And that's certainly true. Eugenics featured very prominently in a number of Nazi policies, and there were millions of people killed, of course, by the Nazi government. Of course, they weren't all killed for eugenic reasons, but a number of them were, uh, in fact, done so. And here's a piece of, of um, Nazi propaganda that uh, tells you uh, exactly why you uh, should be supporting uh, this, this particular uh, policy. And you, can, you don't even have to be able to read German to know what's going on here, right? So here's the, here's the doctor in his white coat looking after this uh, uh, poor man here who is clearly uh, 
mentally defective in some way, it's not clear how, but you can see, you know, 60,000 Reichsmarks, you don't need to know how much a Reichsmark was worth, it was a lot of money, quite. and in fact, if you, if you read a little bit further and you do know some German, uh, it says here basically, that's the lifetime cost of this feeble-minded man to the community, and, and this bit here is, is, you know, fellow countrymen, this is your money too. So it's the same, same sentiment is in the Dearborn Independent for Michigan, right? It's all about how much it's going to cost the taxpayer. So, um, so there were, you know, as I say, strong eugenic laws in um, Germany as well. So why did eugenics fail? So I'm going to get on to New Zealand in just a moment. Why did eugenics fail? Well, it is true that the association with the Nazi government means that there's a quick and easy argument to say why eugenics is a bad thing. But in fact, it's not a historically accurate argument because eugenics was practiced in the West, in fact, in parts of the world that you consider to be quite liberal, like Scandinavia, for example. So people were still being sterilized in Scandinavia into the 1950s and 60s on eugenic grounds, well after people knew what had happened in Germany. So it's not really true about the Nazi atrocities, although that's how we think of it today, or a lot of people think of it today. Actually, it's got a lot to do with changes in our ethical views of a number of really important things. So one of them, for example, is, uh, is to do with patients' rights in medicine. The idea that patients have rights in medicine is a really modern idea, as I'm sure many of you know. Uh, it didn't used to be the case that people could turn down medical treatment, right? And there was an important Supreme Court case in America where a man had cancer and didn't want to take the particular treatment that was uh, being forced upon him by the doctors, he took his case to the American Supreme Court and won, and as a consequence of that decision, in America at least, it meant that patients had the right to refuse treatment. The irony in that particular case, of course, is that the poor man had died of his cancer by the time he had won his uh, uh, legal victory. The rise of feminism, and in particular the emphasis that feminism puts on reproductive autonomy, also strikes right at the heart of eugenic laws, which of course have nothing to do with reproductive autonomy. So if you want to know more about the details of that, there's a paper there that Diane and I have um, written about that very argument. Just to show you how ethical views have changed, here is um, H. H. Laughlin, who worked for the Eugenics Record Office, which was on Long Island in New York, um, and supported by the Carnegie Institute, writing in 1914, society must look upon the germplasm as belonging to society and not solely to the individual who carries it. The idea that society, or in particular the government, might have some rights to your genes is, some, is an idea that we just wouldn't countenance today. In fact, it probably never would even occur to people that people might make an argument like that. So our ethical views have really changed quite dramatically in the 20th century. So what about New Zealand? Right? Here we are, miles from anywhere, maybe we were insulated from all these crazy ideas in places like America and Germany and we can look down upon them uh, with our uh, long Scottish noses as it says in the octagon. Well, um, if you go and look into New Zealand history, so you go and look and say Keith Sinclair's book or you go and look at a more recent book say by Michael King or James Balich and look for the word eugenics in the index, you won't find it. Right? It's simply not there. So the simple view is that eugenics was absent from New Zealand's history. And it's true, we never passed a compulsory sterilisation law, and so clearly, you know, we're on the side of the good guys, right? Well, hmm, maybe. It kind of doesn't fit with what something else that we know about our history, which is that we were a social laboratory for the world. We entertained all sorts of radical um, socio-political ideas, some of which we're now today very proud of, and Surely eugenics being in the same kind of category of things that had widespread support, certainly in academia, particularly in the medical community, and surely that must have had some, some uh, impact in New Zealand, and if not, then why not? So it's an interesting question, whatever the answer is from a historical point of view. So, you know, we gave women the vote in this experiment in 1893, and Five years later, we came up with one of the first old age pension schemes in the world, the um, Labour Government Social Security Act in 1938 that, that introduced the welfare state to New Zealand was, was extremely um, radical, uh, even, well, possibly even today, and the 1972 accident compensation scheme that was set up by the uh, Kirk Labour Government, again, it was, was groundbreaking in the ideas about a social contract that was made. These were, these were interesting and and cutting edge experiments. So if you delve back into the textbooks, you discover something called the 1928 Mental Defectives Amendment Act. So you have to be kind of, I suppose a bit um, peculiar to go looking around there, but you discover that in fact, it's just one of a whole series of parliamentary acts that had to do with different bits of uh, 
I suppose, legislation to do with mental defects. So the very first one, of course, was before we had a parliament, but I, I've coded them in this particular way because I wanted to, to um, show you that they actually, the emphasis has changed in a really interesting way over time. So the ones in red there, you notice all seem to have the word lunatics or imbecile on them, and they're all really about public safety. The, the legislators were concerned about the effects of people who were um, considered to be lunatics or imbeciles on the general public. So it was a, it was a kind of public protection thing. The ones in, in light blue there, it's interesting, the Mental Defectives Act of 1911 was the first to distinguish, in New Zealand at least, between mental deficiency and mental illness. Now to us, that's a really obvious difference, right? But 100 years ago, it wasn't so obvious. And I think, you know, it's, it's really interesting how our ideas and our classification of various... Um, uh, uh, I don't want to know, various uh, con uh, human conditions, I suppose, has changed. Um, the ones in, in darker blue there, you see that the emphasis has shifted to mental health, right? So it's a much more concern about the patient, right? So we've moved from being concerned about public safety to this important distinction between mental defect and mental um, uh, illness, and then to concerns about the patient. So. In fact, if you go and look a little bit further back, John Stenhouse, the historian in, um, in the history and art history department here, has written an interesting essay about the um, ideas of this man, William Pember Reeves. So he was writing in the 1890s, and, and like many people at the time, he saw New Zealand as having great advantages over Britain. So this is at the time when, when women were given the vote and the old age pension scheme came in. He saw New Zealand as as free from those stultifying constraints of British society, in particular the class system. Right? So New Zealand, starting off afresh, could do all these progressive things like giving women the vote and having old age pensions and, and there was various other things he did, for example this, um, uh, this Industrial Conciliation and Arbitration Act, which was a really far-sighted piece of labour legislation. All those kinds of things could be done in New Zealand and we could show the mother country how to make tremendous progress and throw off the shackles that uh, still held Britain back. He was, like many people at the time, a Fabian socialist. He was probably the first Minister of Labour in the world and Minister of also Education and Justice in the Liberal governments of the time. And the Industrial Conciliation and Arbitration Act was really quite uh, an important piece of legislation. But he also tried to get through Parliament something called the Undesirable Immigrants Exclusion Bill. And that was aimed at stopping um, certain immigrants coming in, uh, particularly those who were um, considered to be uh, imbeciles or feeble-minded, but he also wanted to stop the Chinese coming in. Right? He was vehemently anti-Chinese. What's interesting is that he wasn't, and nowhere through any of this, are uh, there obvious anti-Maori elements of this legislation, which is something I can come back to if you're interested. Anyway, he sought to ban paupers, so those who were very poor, and the, one of the reasons the legislation failed is that a number of MPs pointed out that they wouldn't have got into the country because they didn't have enough money at the time either. A lot of people who came to New Zealand really didn't have lots of money. So let's go forward to 1928 and get to the meat of what I really want to talk about, which is, um, is this 1928 Act. So um, after the Second World War, there were a number of events that occurred that led to great concern about the incidence of mental defect. So, uh, not surprisingly, it had something to do with economics. So in 1921 and also in 1926, there was a collapse in farm prices. And so whenever you go through some kind of economic um, uh, difficulty, you can see that people are always looking around for, um, for various kinds of scapegoats, I suppose. It was also a time, as some of you will know, where there, was, there were quite strong conflicts between Catholics and Protestants about various things. You may know, of course, too, that Prohibition almost got passed at the end of the First World War, 1918, and it was only the votes of the returning servicemen that stopped Prohibition coming to um, New Zealand. So there was a lot of public concern also about, about mental defect, and again, this thing about the cost to the state, right? So the New Zealand Truth. I don't know how many people here remember the New Zealand Truth. You have to be of a certain age to remember the Truth newspaper. So the New Zealand Truth uh, was one of the ones that campaigned about the, the cost to the state. People were concerned about the fecundity of the feeble-minded, just as they were uh, in other parts of the world, and also about the frequency of sexual offences. And so um, Sir Maui Pomare, who was the Minister of Health at the time, decided that he would um, 
uh, do something about this and like all good ministers he uh, set up a committee to look into it. Um, Pomeroy was very interesting because he trained at Battle Creek in Michigan for his medical degree and the um, principal of the college there was a very um, strong pro-eugenic um, American doctor. So um, he set up this committee in 1924 um, to inquire into mental defects and sexual offenders and it was chaired by um, one W.H. Triggs who had been the um, uh, editor of the Christchurch Press. He was a member of the Legislative Council, which was the upper house of New Zealand at the time, so the House of Representatives like we have today, but also we had an upper house, the Legislative Council, and he had experience chairing committees on a not completely dissimilar topic, the inquiry into venereal disease. So they wrote a report, like all good committees, in 1925, and it had three parts. And you can, you can read that um, second quotation there, but the critical thing is that the committee said, really, it was of utmost importance that mental defects should be prevented from reproducing. Right? So the same sentiments that you can see um, in the, the um, outline I gave of negative eugenics before, that they wanted to stop the feeble-minded in particular, from having more children, just as, as the eugenic programs in California and in Nazi Germany had, um, had uh, uh, established. So they actually went on to recommend there was something called the Eugenics Board set up, and that Eugenics Board would, would make a register of the feeble-minded. Interesting, you can see this, again, this blurring between uh, mental defect and mental illness. Uh, the feeble-minded, the epileptics, the moral imbeciles, and those discharged from mental hospitals. It would recommend to the minister that, uh, about things to do with segregation, supervision or treatment of those different classes. It would have the power to implement segregation, and this is where the, the uh, tricky thing began, and sterilisation, and that sterilisation might be a condition of release, provided, so they're talking about parental concept, uh, consent, consent here, and so that's the, the parents of the individual who was considered feeble-minded. They also wanted to forbid marriages and by implication sex with people who were on the register and interestingly in a, in a sort of a harking back to uh, the 1890s they wanted to put controls on immigration to prevent the arrival of yet more people who were feeble minded. After the uh, inquiry had reported back, there was an election. And in 1925, the Reform Party won an enormous majority in Parliament and Gordon Coates became the Minister. Alexander Young, this man in the middle there, became the Minister of Health, replacing Pomeray, who was, um, who was um, increasingly suffering from ill health at the time. And, and the other important person in this, in this um, history is Theodore Gray there, who by that stage had become the Inspector General of Mental Hospitals. And he was sent by Young on a really long, extensive tour to America and to Europe to look at eugenic programs in California and in Virginia and in Germany and in all sorts of different places. And um, it was a very long trip. He was overseas for months, I think nine months. And, and Gray wrote an autobiography which was published. And it's what's really interesting, that autobiography was published in the 1950s and he doesn't mention in the autobiography this tour that he did to look at eugenic programs. It just showed you how much things had changed in that 30 years. So Gray wrote a report, it's called Mental Deficiency in New Zealand, and it's, um, it's an um, annex to the Journal of the House of Representatives. And um, uh, he recommended that there be a eugenics board that would put together a register, that there be a ban on marriage and sex between those who are um, on the register, that the feeble-minded be segregated in what he called farm colonies, and that sterilisation of the feeble-minded should be possible in some circumstances, almost completely mirroring what the Triggs Committee had um, had come up with. And as a consequence of that, the Mental Defectives Amendment Bill uh, was drawn up. So uh, you probably know most of this, but in case you don't, this is how parliamentary procedure worked in the 1920s. So a, a bill would be introduced into um, Parliament in the first reading, and that would usually be really brief. There'd be just an introduction, the title of the bill would be read out, and maybe some uh, little sort of abstract of what the bill was about. It would then go on to a second reading where there would be substantive debate. Right? So that's where the bill, the whole purpose of the bill would be debated much more in Parliament. If it got through the second reading, it would then be sent to a select committee where there would be public submissions and the, the select committee would make amendments to the bill and it would be reported back to the House where it would go through what's called the committee stage where the bill would be debated clause by clause. So each clause would be examined by Parliament and, um, and 
subject to some kind of vote. It might only be a voice vote if it was uncontroversial, but it would be subject to a vote. And then there'd be, at the very end, there'd be a third reading where again there could be some debate. It would be unusual though for there to be substantive amendments made at the third reading, although that was certainly um, possible. And then the bill would be sent to the Legislative Council, which would go through a similar procedure, although in practice the Legislative Council did almost nothing. It was just a rubber stamp and that was why it was, um, it was uh, uh, um, uh, uh, abandoned in the 1950s. And then it would go to the Governor General for consent. So these are the two, these two stages here. The second reading and the committee stage are the places where if a bill is being opposed by the opposition, that's where most of the argument takes place. So if we cut to what happened in the, in the second reading of the bill, uh, which happened in July 1928, um, it immediately ran into fierce opposition that was led by um, Peter Fraser, who of course, as you all know, later became Prime Minister, um, and he was our Prime Minister during the Second World War. Um, it's important to realise though that um, the Labour Party, did, who were the official opposition at the time, did not oppose all of the bills. So the first six clauses were relatively uncontroversial. They had to do with the reform of the mental hospitals department, and that had unanimous support. So like, like most parliamentary bills, there were bits that were um, unanimously or, or widely supported and bits that weren't. It's interesting, the, um, Fraser went into quite, about, quite a lot of detail, scientific detail, and used scientific arguments against the bill. So he took that CaliCat data that we, I showed you before and actually went through and, and used standard arguments from the time to say that that kind of data was, was worthless. And so, as I said to you, the CaliCat data was, was critiqued at the time, but it made very little difference in a whole lot of places that it mattered. He talked about various inheritance models, and what I think is particularly interesting is that he said at the end of his uh, first speech that every child should have opportunity to grow up in a healthy environment, and he specifically commended the work of the Plunkett Society and um, Sir Truby King. So, um, Young, Young responded and, uh, to, the, to all the furore about the sterilisation clause and he said that the government wouldn't force the issue and he admitted that the public would not be ready. And he was asked um, subsequently by Harry Holland, who's down the bottom on the right there, who was the leader of the opposition, the leader of the Labour Party at the time, um, Holland asked him, does the minister intend to stand by the sterilisation clause? They were really focused on that clause. And Young replied, I shall not say that at this stage. I would like to get it through and will if the House desires it. So he was really equivocal about just what was going to happen to that sterilisation clause. Anyway, the bill was referred to the um, Public Health Committee and it came back to the House amended in a number of places on the 18th of September. But the amendments were not about either the sterilisation clause or the clause that forbade marriage between those who were on the um, register for the Eugenics Board. So at the committee stage, to say that the debate was acrimonious would be understating it. It was really a vicious debate. The committee stage started at 4.30 in the afternoon and it went through and they adjourned at 7 a.m. the next morning. And I discovered something really interesting, is that, is that when, when you go past midnight in the House of Representatives, the date doesn't change, right? The, the Parliament is all important, right? So they were still on the uh, 25th of September, even when it was round at four in the morning, right? So they kept on going round to 7 a.m. And there were, uh, they took 11 and a half hours just to agree on a short title for the bill. So the Labour Party put up amendment after amendment after amendment, all of which lost by staggeringly large margins. So, for example, Holland moved to delay the implementation of the bill for a year, which would take it after the 1928 election. And they lost, you know, they lost by 36 to 15. So that reflected, they had this, this system of pairing, so if one of the government members wasn't in the House, then one of the opposition members would step out, and, and so people were paired, so the government's majority was always preserved. And so that, that motion failed... 36 to 15, which reflected the enormous majority that reform had in the parliament at the time. Interestingly, that 15 included four people who would subsequently become prime minister, and that turns out to be very important in, in the story uh, later on. So um, this was going on, there were lots and lots of arguments, and um, Young offered to hold over certain clauses, but he wouldn't say which ones they were, and at that point, somewhere around about um, seven in the morning, Gordon Coates, who was the Prime Minister, got fed up with what was going on and essentially took over from Young and tried to shepherd the bill through, through Parliament. And, and really it was a, really a fairly subtle but, but very public way of showing that he really didn't have confidence in the way that Young was handling the bill.
and he decided to make the bill a party measure. So it previously hadn't been a party measure, but making it a party measure meant that the, the government MPs were subject to the party whip, and they had to vote along with the government. And so even the 36 to 15, there, there were a number of government um, MPs who spoke up against the bill, who were in favour of delaying it for a year. But when push came to shove, they didn't actually vote against it, except for one MP who was the MP for um, Gisborne, as it turns out. So, um, he, and so Coates said, we're going to make this a party measure that's going to be subject to the whip, and, and said that some clauses might be postponed, but again he wouldn't say which. So as I say, at 7am at they, they decided to adjourn, and they went off for their mutton chops for breakfast apparently, and that's what the um, Evening Star reported, and uh, the sterilisation clause was, with, was withdrawn at some point then, and of course you can't actually find out exactly what happened. So. Um, uh, at, they resumed again at about 9am, and after 9am, whoops, after 9am they uh, argued for another two and three quarter hours about various other aspects of the bill, but the sterilisation clause and the marriage restriction clause had been withdrawn. So the question of course is why? Right? What? The government had the numbers, right? They had the numbers, they could have forced it through, why did they not force it? They had an enormous majority, they knew they were going to be re-elected in the 1928 election. So. Uh, you know, that's the job of the historian to try and come up with some possible answers. So one of them is that is this, this admission from both Young and from Coates that the public weren't quite ready. And that's certainly true. If you go and look at newspapers of the time and look at the letters to the editor Collins, which I spent a lot of time doing, you can find that a lot of people were writing to the newspaper about this. In fact, there was lots of debate, both pro and anti, but there was a lot of debate about this. This was not a bill that was sort of, you know, sneaking under the radar. Everybody knew about this bill. And there was significant opposition, obviously, as I pointed out, from the Labour Party, also from the remnants of the old Liberal Party. Um, there was opposition from some groups of academics. Academic, academics were split. Certainly psychologists and educationalists were um, against the bill. Biologists were, were split. There were the biologists who were down here, people like Benham, were very pro the bill. Um, uh, academics from um, other places were not necessarily so. Um, medics were, were adamantly in favour of the bill. So the medical community was not completely unanimous, but largely in favour of the bill. The Catholic Church was against it, which is interesting because it was before or the Pope had explicitly condemned eugenic laws. Right? So the Pope later on in the 1920s um, uh, issued a statement which, uh, in which he said eugenic laws um, were against the church's doctrine. Um, and the other thing too is there are a number of newspapers who were critical of it. So a number of newspaper editors. And here's just an example. I put this in in case John Stenhouse was here because John Stenhouse loves going trout fishing. And, and um, you, if you just take a moment to look at the bill, you can see here, I don't know who the man with the mental hospital's hat on is. I don't think it's young. Look, he could possibly make it to be out to be young. It certainly isn't Theodore Gray, who was very well known, and there were little ditties about Theodore Gray. You know, mummy, mummy, save me from Dr. Gray. He's coming to school to take me away. And there's a whole, whole thing about um, concern about Theodore Gray. But it wasn't, it's clearly not Gray. But um, the MP was, in fact, the MP for, um, for uh, Nelson, oh, sorry, for Avon, uh, one Dan Sullivan. And he, he argued that really the, the, um, the, the clauses about uh, people who could be detained were so wide that, that anyone who showed any kind of form of eccentricity could be uh, caught up in it. So um, the other thing, as I pointed out to you, um, the, there were some government MPs who were against the bill. But there was also, if you notice, there were a lot of MPs who simply weren't there. Right? So some of the votes, one of the votes was 30 to 10. And, you know, there were 80 MPs in the House, or 80-odd MPs in the House. So basically, half the MPs weren't even there. And my suspicion is that there were a number of government MPs who really didn't like this, who just didn't want to be seen in Parliament voting for such legislation. It's also worth remembering that the Reform Party, in spite of its name, was actually a Conservative Party, right? So the Reform Party was one of the two parties that went in uh, to form the modern-day National Party. So they were, their sort of political viewpoint is a, is, is a conservative one. They're not likely to want to be on the cutting edge of social legislation, the kind of thing like giving women the vote and, um, and um, compulsory arbitration and so on. Um, but possibly the thing that mattered the most was the closeness of the election, right? No government, no matter what its majority, wants to be putting controversial legislation through Parliament 
a month or two before the election, right? It's just, you, you're on a hiding to nothing, right? So the only stuff that you put through Parliament right before the election is stuff that's sort of motherhood and apple pie, right? So nothing that people would disagree with. And they had a huge majority. They could deal with it after the election, right? They'll deal with it after the election. They could come back to those clauses, they could revisit those two clauses and put them into some other piece of legislation if they wanted to do so. So what happened was the 1928 election gave an enormous surprise. The Reform Party lost. Right? And in fact, the three parties, the Reform and what was by then called the United Party, which was the remains of the Liberal Party, and the Labour Party were the, were the large parties in Parliament, and United managed to form a government with Labour support. You know, this is not completely different from the kinds of things that we do today. Right? And Sir Joseph Ward became the Prime Minister. He was one of those four future Prime Ministers who voted against the bill, not the least because he was a Catholic. Right? And again, some of his... Um, his uh, Catholic um, viewpoints would have uh, surely influenced his view about it. Um, having said that, um, George Forbes was effectively running the government because uh, Ward, was, in fact, was not very well. He was, in fact, so um, not well that he misread some of his speech notes um, in, during the election campaign. But that misreading is allegedly why they won the election. It was all to do with how much money they were going to borrow from Britain, and he got the figure out by a factor of 10, apparently. He didn't have his glasses on. And everybody thought this was a great idea because it would really solve all the pro economic problems. He borrowed all this money, and I don't know what they thought about paying it back. But anyway, people thought it was a great idea and um, the, the uh, United Party came romping home. But Forbes was looking after the government at the time and eventually became the Prime Minister um, uh, after Ward died, or actually just before I think Ward died. <coughs> But Forbes also had voted against the bill. So he was one of the, another one of the four that had voted against the bill. In 1931, the election was won by a coalition between United and Reform, but, but Forbes again remained the Prime Minister. So um, uh, in the 1935 election, of course, the Labour Party under Michael J. Savage won, and Fraser became the Minister of Health. So, and, and Savage, of course, being a Labour Party um, MP, had voted against the bill, and Fraser became the Prime Minister after Savage's death. So you can see that the next four Prime Ministers were all individuals who had voted against the bill. So there was never any support at the highest levels to revisit those uh, two clauses, the sterilisation and the uh, marriage restriction clause. So uh, just to sort of summarise where we've got to here, um, I think it's really interesting that New Zealand came really close to enacting a st compulsory sterilisation law, much closer than most people realise, certainly most historians realise, and probably most of the people in this room I, I hesitate to suggest. There was strong support for sterilisation. There were lots of people who thought it would be a good idea. The 1925 Triggs Committee report thought so, the 1927 Gray report thought so, and the medical community were almost um, united in um, supporting it. That um, 1928 Act saw those clauses withdrawn and there was widespread opposition from a, a, a really disparate um, a set of, of uh, uh, parts of the community. Um, but as I said, many government MPs were unenthusiastic. After 1928, there were a number of campaigns to reinstate that, those sterilisation clauses and to get them through Parliament. And, and as I said, they, it didn't succeed because of, of a lack of support at the highest levels. But um, I want to... Um, I want to just point out a, a, a couple of things here. So you might wonder who this, if I get the mouse in the right place, who this person here is. So this is, this is Nina Barra. Now, does anybody recognise Nina? Well, you won't. You won't recognise Nina Barra because there are no public photos of her. I found this photo in a really obscure place. So Nina Barra was, was a woman who was into everything. She was into the WEA, the Red Cross, the League of Nations Union of New Zealand, CORSO, the United Nations Association of New Zealand, and later she became very prominent in the National Party. But she's known mostly for her work in the women's division of the New Zealand Farmers Union, which was the forerunner of Federated Farmers. And she was the Dominion Vice President and an advisory board member for 22 years, from 1925 right through to 1947. Um, she was president of the Masterton branch from, for three years, and she edited the women's division magazine, a magazine called the New Zealand Country Woman. Uh, New Zealand Country Woman, I tell you, is, is an amazing um, magazine because even the Turnbull Library doesn't have a copy of every edition of it. So if somewhere in your basement you have copies of the New Zealand Country Woman, I would love to see them, be, and, and you should... You know, you should bequeath them to the Turnbull Library. They'll probably be the most valuable thing in your whole household, um, certainly from a historical point of view. Anyway, Nina Barra argued 
argued repeatedly. She published a pamphlet at her own expense. She was friendly with Young. When she went to Britain, she had a formal letter of introduction from Alexander Young, um, uh, uh, essentially um, uh, asking any, uh, any of the senior people that she met in Britain um, to, um, to show her the highest degree of hospitality. She was extremely well connected and she was a very good writer. So she wrote this own pamphlet. The, the um, New Zealand countrywoman published a whole series of pro-eugenic um, articles right through the 1930s. Um, she um, was, was not alone. Um, some of you might have come across Doris Gordon on occasion. Doris Gordon, there are much, many more pictures of Doris Gordon. She was um, a Taranaki doctor who was, um, amongst other things, vehemently anti-Catholic. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. You come across, if you go into the Turnbull Library and look at some of her speech notes and things, you're just amazed at um, some of the things that she would have said publicly, things today that, that you, you would think would be splashed all over the newspapers. Um, and it's interesting because the, um, the women's division of the New Zealand Farmers Union, there are lots of references to arguments between um, Catholic women and, and um, uh, people who were pushing the eugenic argument. And I think that's... Um, it's an area that, that I would like to look into a little bit more. But probably the one that, that is most extraordinary is Elizabeth Gunn. How many people have heard of Elizabeth Gunn? Well, if you have, she's known for founding the, um, the uh, health camps for children. Right? Right? But in fact, she also went before the Triggs Committee to give evidence. And in the Triggs Committee, and a bit that you actually have to sign a bit of paper because the Ministry of Health even today doesn't like people looking at the evidence that was given to the Triggs Committee, she advocated that there be a lethal chamber for imbecile children. So what's really interesting, right, so we think of Elizabeth Gunn today as being a hero for, for setting up health camps. And indeed she is, right, it's a good thing. So what this does is show to us what the what the goals of the eugenist movement were. They were laudable goals, right? It's that the means today we find so objectionable. Anyway, so what is the take home message? So the take home message that I really want you to get from this is that this dichotomy we have between you know, the evils of Nazi Germany and places like Virginia and California and the lily white view of New Zealand that didn't have anything to do with eugenics is an illusion. It's way too simple. And it's important to realise that in many places the legislation only just failed. Right? So the New Zealand legislation could easily have been passed and then we'd have to tell a completely different story. But that doesn't make any sense. How would we have to tell a completely different story? Right? We ought to be able to tell a story that's consistent with how strong the support for eugenics was in New Zealand. And to explain that and to explain things about what people who were pro-eugenic did after the failure of the sterilisation legislation. Right? So people like Elizabeth Gunn right, said she's really interesting because she had views that today we find abhorrent and she, she realised that she, the, the sterilisation legislation wasn't going to happen. How could she improve the condition of the New Zealand population and she could do that by setting up these health camps, right? something that we consider quite laudable. I think that, that contrast is really, really interesting. And that, that, that dichotomy that we have would miss all of that subtlety and all of that interest. So um, I'm going to um, be quite um, self-indulgent here and finish with a plug. Right? So I have a book coming out next month, can you believe, um, that's edited by, by my colleague Diane Paul, whom I mentioned to you before, also um, John Stenhouse, who's in history. And it's actually the first examination of the eugenics movement in these four um, dominions, if you like, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and South Africa, um, as opposed, there's lots of books written about eugenics in Britain, a huge number about eugenics in, in America and in Germany, but there's almost nothing written about uh, eugenics in these four places. And we have, um, uh, I can't remember if it's 12 or 13 edited chapters looking at different aspects of this, some of them looking at just one place, some of them looking more broadly, and it should be out next month, and it's published by Palgrave Macmillan. Thank you. Thank you, Hamish. Questions? Must be lots of questions. Can I kick off and ask you, can you say in brief, how was it decided when someone was simple-minded? Was there some relatively simple test? So the, the formal definition of feeble-mindedness was that they, people were incapable of performing their duties into the position of society into which they were born. Which is a bizarre definition, right? It's a social definition, right? So it depended on the position of society into which you were born. So depending on you know, what you were born as, whether you are born as, you know, as, as nobility or whether you were born as a pauper, you, the definition of feeble-mindedness would change. Right? So I find, find that particularly interesting. There were attempts to try 
and um, standardized it. So people took IQ tests. So IQ tests um, were introduced into America in, t in, the, um, in the 1910s and, and used quite extensively. And there were, there were attempts to link IQ scores to the definition of feeble-mindedness. And they were, they were criticized by a number of people. So there wasn't, there wasn't sort of a, a, you know, an IQ score that, that meant that you would be feeble-minded. So the IQ, the IQ um, distribution does have a number of, of technical definitions. So all the words that we use today as insults like morons and idiots and so on, they all had technical definitions um, depending on what IQs were, um, what the IQs of different individuals were. But um, the, technically feeble-minded didn't, it didn't have a, a um, standard, what we would think of today as a standard medical definition. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Hi, Hamish. Um, just two things. One, my father was in the army in the 1950s, and this is just an aside. I got his his army records in, and it has in there um, that he's he was actually quite weak-minded. Mm -hmm. Here's his daughter doing a PhD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's just an aside. My quest, my interest is in World War One. How's it, how did returning soldiers suffering from neurasthenia fit into the idea of eugenics at, in the um, post-war period? Um, I can't give you a direct answer about that. What I, what I can say um, uh, is that uh, those returning soldiers were incredibly important in the political uh, events that happened at that time. So not, it wasn't just about the, the, the failure of the... Um, of the prohibition legislation. So those, those collapse in farm prices. Um, World War I was also very important um, in, uh, uh, in changing views in society about the position in which people were born. Right? So um, the consequence of World War I that saw so many um, apparently uh, you know, good, men of good stock being killed in large numbers showed that, in fact, maybe th maybe things about virtue and so on were not quite so simple as people had assumed. So, but I can't really give you an answer to your question there. But I, I can come back to your thing about, about inheritance and so on. So the, one of the things that was very influential and actually came out of some of the, the CaliCAC data, and I haven't talked about it tonight, was a very simple model for the inheritance of feeble-mindedness. So feeble-minded individuals were those individuals, it kind of contradicts what I said before, but the, the model was that the feeble-minded were those individuals who had two copies of a recessive allele. Right? And it was just a so feeble mindedness was a single gene defect, just the way um, cystic fibrosis is. Right? So you had two copies of the little n allele and you were feeble minded. You could be a carrier, big n, little n, and you were just fine, or you could be um, homozygous, big n, and, and you'd be fine and all your children would be fine. So what's interesting is there's all sorts of interesting things that come out of that. So what that means is that, that two individuals who were feeble minded would be little n, little n, and little n, little n. They could only have feeble-minded children, right? But in fact, um, occasionally that wouldn't happen, right? And so the explanation for that is quite straightforward, right? Because that means that the feeble-minded woman had had an affair with someone who was not feeble-minded. <laughs> but of course, the problem with that is, is that people who had affairs, you know, who were adulterers, should of course be feeble-minded because that's the reason that they were adulterers, right? So you run this kind of, you know, Kind of con sort of self-contradictory argument that goes through there. So yeah, so it's not not an answer to your question, but it's kind of interesting. Yeah. How much do you think that the current political events in the USA will fan the flames and revive eugenics? Um, it, it's really hard. It's really hard to answer that question. So, uh, as I say, the, you know, to be called a eugenist is not a compliment today. And th there are one or two, um, you know, um, iconoclasts who like to be called uh, a eugenist. And so, so I sort of want to answer your question in two parts. One is about about modern medical testing. Right? So there are people who argue that a lot of modern medical testing for genetic defects and so on is backdoor eugenics. Right? So if you look up the phrase backdoor eugenics in Google, you get an enormous number of hits and they lead to arguments about, about the ethics and morals behind genetic testing and so on. My view of that is that that's a lazy intellectual argument. Right? Calling something eugenics is, is, is to condemn it without actually saying what the problem is. Right? It's like calling someone a communist or a fascist. Right? It just says that you don't like what they think but it's not actually saying what the problem is. Right? So the re one of the reasons that I'm interested in looking at the history of eugenics is to find out what it is that we find today so objectionable about 
about the past, right? And some of it has to do with, with, the, with the lack of individual choice, right? So I talked about, I showed that quotation from, from Laughlin about, about the germplasm belonging to the society and not just individuals. All those kinds of views have changed, right? So we put a lot more emphasis today on the rights of individuals and eugenics offends those modern day views, right? So, um, so there's, there's debate about, uh, nevertheless, there, are, there, there should be debate about um, about genetic testing and what sorts of things should be tested for and what the consequences are. And it's, it's a real minefield and like many ethical debates, there's no simple answer, right? So you can come up with really simple, simple ones about, you know, testing just for the sex of a child, right? And we know that this has been a major problem in China, right, where you can test for the sex of a child and the, the sex ratio now is really biased towards boys being born and the reason boys are born is because that's your social security, you know, if you get old and feeble, you know, you have to be looked after by somebody and it's boys who look after their parents, not, not, not daughters, right? The daughters go off with the husband's family. And so if, it's quite understandable that in China, you would want to have a son rather than a daughter. But of course, there are enormous social problems now in China because the sex ratio is so biased in some parts, especially in, in parts of the country, that there are enormous social problems. So there's no easy, you, know, you can see both sides of that argument there. To, to, now to come back to, right back to your question again about, about America and current social um, things there. So the other, the other dimension to eugenics is, is, is the racism inherent in a lot of eugenic thought. So it wasn't at all uh, a coincidence that Reeves, for example, was concerned about, about the um, immigration of imbeciles and the immigration of Chinese. Right? So there's lots of, what, what's interesting about eugenics in New Zealand is that there's no overlay with Maori. Right? So, so Pomeray was the Minister of um, was the Minister of Health who set up the Triggs Committee and in fact all four Maori MPs voted for the, the 1928 bill, right? So they were all, all government MPs who voted for that 1928 bill. So uh, what, in New Zealand it's very interesting because it's almost unique in that respect, right? That the, that the minority race is not being discriminated against. So it's very, very different in Australia, very, very different in Canada. In this book, there's a really interesting chapter about, about the indigenous people in, in Canada and, and eugenic programs there. Um, so to go back to America, so you know my my con my concerns about America have a lot to do with things to do with race, and I think that's that the link there between eugenics and and race is to me of more concern because I suppose because it's a more it's a more easily abused kind of link than the than the thing to do with medical genetics. So the medical genetics one, I think everybody understands that's really quite complicated. What should you test for? You know, there's some there's some things you can test for that are unequivocally awful, right? You know, Huntington's disease, right? No, no, Tay Sachs disease, right? There's no those are you know if you ever want to say well that's an evil gene, those are those are pretty much evil genes, right? No, just I don't know. how many people read the thing in the in the ODT about Huntington's disease? Oh, there was a heartrending article, wasn't it? And there are were, there were awful stories about Huntington's. So you, you, I can imagine, you know, a program that was out there to try and do something about Huntington's disease, possibly not through, you know, not through sterilisation, but genetic testing to get rid of Huntington's disease. I mean, I think that'd be a good thing. Huntington's disease is horrible, right? So, um, but other things are not so clear, right? There's all sorts of, you know, genes that. Uh, that, that might be involved in particular things. And the other thing, of course, about genetic testing is that the things we really care about, like, like intelligence and, and, you know, getting on with people and, and height and susceptibility to heart disease, those are all complicated things, right? Really complicated things that, that are, are complicated not just genetically, but also because of the interactions with the environment. So the things we talk about all the time are, are, are Tay-Sachs and Huntington's and and cystic fibrosis, all because they're really simple, right? But most of the stuff we care about isn't simple. So that's a long-winded argument, a uh, long-winded response to your question. In 1928, what would, have the, what would the method of sterilisation be, and was the debate including uh, government funding of it? Uh, and was it a windfall for the medics, perhaps? Uh, I, no, it would have been government funded. And it, what was interesting is that they were very clear about the difference between sterilisation and desexualisation. So there would not have been castration most of the time. So castration was, was talked about sometimes for sexual offenders, but for mental defectives they were clear for me and it would be vasectomy. Right, so they were, it was, it's quite, was, there was quite a lot of debate and a lot of the, um, a lot of the um, public consultation was, was around that particular um, aspect. 
And again, for um, women, it, you know, it wouldn't have been a hysterectomy, it would have been a, um, some kind of tubal ligation and so on. Question? Yes. Um, Can no, you re repeat know. the question? Oh, so the question was, oh, well, I don't really need this, do I? Um, uh, the, the, um, the question was about what of the 60,000 people thereabouts who were sterilised, what proportion were male and female? And the short answer is I don't know. Um, I, don't, I don't know that I've even seen that data. It probably is there if you look in the right places. And I don't even have a feel for whether it was biased one way or the other. I mean, you know, the, the operation for women is a lot more complicated, so you might think that more men were sterilised because it was easier to do, but I, I, I honestly don't know. Good question, though. I'd love to, love to know the answer. Thank you. <coughs> I'm just wondering if there was a contradiction here, because when Truby King arrived at uh, Seacliff Lunatic Asylum, he wasn't prepared to just enact a sort of containment of patients. He, in fact, wanted to... He showed respect for them. And he gave them something useful to do. He trained his um, staff up to show mm -hmm. respect and to treat them. He certainly had, had no ideas of punishment or sterilisation. In fact, he thought... Uh, and they, these were a wide collection of alcoholics and people with uh, inherited mental mm -hmm. disorders and things like that. Um, that, is that not a contradiction to what you're saying in, all, in the fact that there was a movement to, towards so, sterilisation? I'm so glad you asked that question because in this book, Diane Paul has a chapter on Truby King and he's the most interesting person. If you go... So I think of Truby King, and, you know, I'm not really a historian, I think of Truby King as the founder of the Plunkett Society. And, you know, what does Plunkett do? It, it, you know, it sends, it sends um, women in to help mothers with their babies and to make sure that they get the right environment in which to thrive. It seems the antithesis of eugenics, right, because it's all about environment. If you go and read some modern historiography of King, though, he is described as an ardent eugenicist and uh, an extreme eugenicist, and you can find this in all sorts of places. And Diane writes about this apparent contradiction. So if you go back to the 1920s, he was a member of the Triggs Committee. Right? So he was a member of the committee that wrote that report that recommended sterilisation in some circumstances. So he's a really complex character, a really complex character. Um, and the, the other thing is that the, the distinction that we make today between environment and genetics was, was not anywhere near as clear at the time. So, so and you, you, I mean, you can see that too in, um, in uh, Elizabeth Gunn, right? So she, you know, she went from, from being concerned about genetics and realised that she wasn't going to get anywhere in that, in that direction to, to having health camps, right? So, so people, under, people like King, I think King is really interesting. I wouldn't describe him as a eugenicist because if you use that term, then everybody who's concerned about the human condition um, that has anything to do with development, so genes and environment, would, would be by that definition a eugenicist. Um, and I think that that makes the term more or less meaningless. So, I mean, like you, I have a much more positive view of, of, of King, but, but, I mean, I commend to you the chapter in this book which, which discusses these different views of King and, um, and, and, and um, quotes a number of the recent historians, some of whom work at this university, who have described King as a, as a eugenicist. And I can say more, but that's probably... Does that answer your question? believed, in fact, that all these patients at the lunatic asylum were there because they'd had a bad upbringing. Mm -hmm. he, he said, bring the women in from the fields, from the mm -hmm. factories, they should be at home looking after the kids, and it's because they're not at home that mm -hmm. these people go off in directions that society doesn't want them. Yeah, yeah so, they, I mean, they had the wrong kinds of foods as, as children and as infants and so on, yeah. So, I mean, today, that's what we would think of as being you know, he'd been an environmentalist, right? So it would be all the influence of the environment on the development of the child and nothing to do with the, with the genetics. Another question? I think that's the end of the questions. Mm -hmm. Hamish, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Would everyone join me in thanking Hamish? <laughs>